Okay, um, so I just want to introduce Jenny Thatcher today. Um, Jenny is an, uh, currently an events manager for the Sociological Review, um, and she last year she finished her PhD in um, the University of East London. And Jenny's research mainly focuses on migration and, um, and po Polish migration in particular at the minute, but she's very interested in migration theoretically and from a Borgesian perspective. And Jenny is um, a co-founder and co-convener for the study group that we have been colleagues for the past six years. <laughs> um, so I'll just hand you over to Jenny. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for inviting me. I feel really honoured to be invited um, to speak here today. Um, so I'm going to present my paper today. Is, um, it's called You've Got to Have Faith, um, Case Study of Polish Parents' Secondary School Choice for Their Children in London and Nottingham. And so in this presentation, I'm going to show the context in which Polish parents execute their practices, goals, and strategies of secondary school choice within two local education markets, that of London and Nottingham. Firstly, I'm going to just touch on Polish migration, contextualise Catholic schools within the education market, and then move on to my empirical findings showing how the different availability of schools in local area impacts upon choice, but that choice is ultimately entwined with social class and social reproduction. So that's just, um, I'm just going to outline Polish migration. So um, the AA accession in May 2004 gave way to unprecedented and unexpected movements of migrants to the UK. Um, and data revealed that 41%, 1.1 million of residents from other EU countries living in England and Wales were from countries that joined the EU since 2004 and onwards. Um, of these residents, those born in Poland made up the largest group of nearly 600,000. Um, between 2001 to 2011, the overall number of births to non-UK born women residing in England and Wales nearly doubled from around 98,000 in 2001 to 185,000 in 2011. Poland was the most common country for non-UK births of children um, for mothers. So I'm just going to bring those charts up there. And um, so the first chart, I don't know if you can see. So this is basically babies born in England and Wales who had mothers from other European, uh, mothers from other European countries according to the 2011 census data. And you can see there that Poland in comparison to other European countries, had the highest birth rates. Um, and then the second graph is actually internationally. So this is the top 10 most common countries of births of mothers from non-UK um, born mothers in England and Wales in 2012. So this is, this is across all migration groups in Britain. And again, you see Poland is the highest there. So if we're thinking about how um, why this is an important part of research is because the, the birth rate for Polish, for Polish migrants and, and the Polish migration figures are quite high, so it's been quite important to understand how they are engaging with the British education system. Um, it should also be noted that um, when, when we first joined the EU, um, when EU accession happened, there was an underestimation of how big a flow the migration flow was going to be, but also it was underestimated how much of this migration was going to be long term. And, um, and I think from what I found in my research as well is that a lot of my participants had come here only to work temporarily, but once they'd had children or they'd brought children at a very young age and they started to engage with other services, particularly schools, it became more difficult to go back to Poland and this, this tended to extend their stay and make them settle permanently. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, talk about the British education market. So increased marketisation of education over the last 40 years has been motivated by ideological commitments with excessive government, both Labour and Conservative, uh, uh, pursuing the commodification of education. And then so we need to think about how Catholic schools fit into the education market because 95% um, of uh, the Polish population 
is Catholic and my actual research sites were Polish um, Catholic Saturday schools which were linked to the Polish Catholic Church so the predominant choice was Catholic schools and um, so since the early 19th century the church has been involved in the education provision um, in the UK following mass Irish migration to industrial cities in the mid 19th century the Roman Catholic Church started to build a network of Catholic schools in an attempt to provide education to Catholic children between 1950 to 2000 the Roman Catholic Church continued to build and expand secondary schools as such the largest largest proportion of faith schools in England are Roman Catholic schools at 58%. The majority of faith schools um, in Britain, in, in the UK, are Christian, that includes Church of England, and that is 98%. On average, Roman Catholic schools in England achieve high test scores in comparison to non-dominational schools. In the UK, this means that Roman Catholic schools often feature in the top brackets of the an annual published league tables on educational performance, both at a primary and a secondary school level. So the principles of choice can be, generali can be generalizable to some extent, but the local and specific relations of choice must not be forgotten. Education policies are embedded within local cultural political surroundings. As such, research into two different cities, Nottingham and London, provides an opportunity to explore Polish migrant parents' engagement with a complex and competitive schooling system. Their school choice interactions practices within two different local education markets have been explored using this adaptive model. So when I came to analyse my findings, this is the, the model that I used. I adapted it slightly from um, Ball. But as you see, I looked at their um, position in communist Poland, post-communist Poland, what, what was happening in England, their structure, social class, habitus, aspiration, practices, the locality, and then education to choice within the wider market and how the local education market interacts with all these different things. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to briefly outline the two sites um, where I did my uh, field work. So firstly London, um, so the participants in my research provided, uh, resided in predominantly five boroughs of London because my main um, research site was the Polish Saturday School. Um, so um, this was in the, the radius of the Polish Saturday School. And so the five boroughs were Islington, Camden, Haringey and Barnet. I'm not going to outline the social demographics of all five boroughs but I'm going to take one borough for example because I think it illustrates what was happening over the all the, the boroughs um, so Enfield and what is noticeable about Enfield is the fact that the borough had experienced um, an increase of 60% of its non-UK resident population between 2001 to 2011 a number slightly above the average increase of 54% for London in general within the same period. Enfield also appeared to have a slightly higher increase in residents born in Eastern European countries when compared to the whole of London on average. And so we had Nottingham and um, I say Nottingham but really it's Nottinghamshire because what has happened is um, the my, my participants resided in two areas either Nottingham City or Rushcliffe and so the, the schools overlap the borough, the, the line there. So they resided in those two areas. Um, and the schools that they were picking would be in those two areas as well. Um, and so again, Nottingham had also seen an increase in the last decade um, of migration, particularly from particularly since the EU accession, um, and especially in the number of Polish residents who made up the largest group of overseas nationals. Polish, Polish migrants accounted for 33% of new national insurance number registrations. Um, and it's, it's important here actually to point out the contrast between the social demographics of the city of Nottingham and that of Rushcliffe. Rushcliffe has been placed the seventh best place to live in the UK. Its schools hold the highest position in Nottingham League tables and actually throughout the whole of the, the, whole of the East Midlands. 92.1% of its ethnic population is white. 
It also has one of the highest life expectancy in the whole of Nottinghamshire. Um, compare this to the city of Nottingham, whose black and minority ethnic group population makes up 34.7%. Nottingham has one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the whole of the country, and one of its largest residential areas, St Anne's, has one of the lowest, lowest life expectancies for men in the whole of Nottinghamshire at just 67 years old. So both case study sites, demographics and social economic characteristics were diverse, as with the schools in both areas. The radius of the research sites and the schools cross polarised localities with, with sharp social economic inequalities. Right. Um, no. So one of my main research questions was whether Roman Catholic schools were being chosen for religious reasons or and or because of their high educational performance and, and good reputation. And so what I should just point out here is that when I originally set out to do this research, I only looked at London. My initial research was only to look at London because I was really interested in on the, um, Polish migration, but how they were engaging with schools in an urban area. And what had happened is the area of London I was looking at had quite a high percentage of selective schools still remaining and some of these selective schools were actually Catholic and I needed another educate I needed another area to see what was going on because there was quite a lot of insistence that they are choosing schools because they are Catholic but then there was that dimension of the selective schools going on so I, I needed another kind of local area to compare it and say actually what what is going on here and how are they how are they engaging with the education market so for the majority of the respondents, both in North London and Nottingham, Catholic secondary schools were often the first choice. There was a slight difference between the two sites, and I'm going to explore this in more detail later. For nearly all the respondents, being Catholic was essential to their way of living. There was a division between those who were deeply Catholic and those who wanted to engage in um, Catholic schools and the Polish Catholic uh, Saturday School to pass a the traditions onto their children. Catholicism was regularly linked to the Polish Saturday School and the Polish community. For many of the parents, providing their children with a Catholic framework was an obligation and a basic requirement of being a good Polish parent. Um, Many, many parents regarded a Catholic foundation to be important, an important, uh, important factor in influencing the future person that their children would transpire to become, with the desire that their children would be good and moral people. Catholicism for the majority of the participants was part of their identity, while they also acknowledged it was a useful resource um, when, when choosing secondary schools for their children. Although being amongst Catholic was important for the majority of the interviewees and was one of the main reasons stated motiv for motivating their choice of Catholic schools for their children, participants were also very strategic in their choice. Many of them were aware of the good academic performance and pupil attainment of state-maintained Catholic schools, especially for socially disadvantaged children. The majority of the parents understood the importance of attending the local Catholic church in order to get their children into a Catholic school. The Catholic church and the priests were often central in helping the parents understand the English education system and their choice of school, specifically when they were newly arrived migrants. The Catholic church became a central resource for school access as the church and the priests would provide the parents with a reference virtually guaranteeing their children entry into the local Catholic school. The parents recognised that the Catholic Church was an effective resource for, for access into a good Catholic school. However, they considered this to be separate from a set of connections and networks that were used for one's own advantage. The interviewees did not promote individualism over all else when it came to their children's educational success. They found this behaviour perplexing when they encountered it. When they did come across competitive behaviour, particularly from English middle class parents, the Polish migrants tended to see this as a problem resulting from the wider structural system and not that of the individual. Often the respondents established their own networks with other migrant groups in which they freely shared information on school access procedures. 
It was never clearly asserted with any certainty during the analysis why Polish parents chose to freely share this information and whether this communal value behaviour might change over time. However, what was evident was when the respondents reflected upon their own school choice practices and strategies, they wondered whether they themselves might be helping to reproduce divisions through school choice. They found this difficult to deal with and they would blame it on what they deemed to be the inadequacies of the education system. And so what they used to say, because there was quite a lot, particularly in Nottingham, there was quite a lot of tension between Catholic school places and middle, middle class parents. And what they would say is that if all schools were good, non-Catholics wouldn't want to send their children to a Catholic school because they wouldn't want their children to have a Catholic religious education. But because the Catholic schools are the best schools, then the middle classes want to send their children to those schools. Make all schools good and you're not going to have a problem. Catholicism was not, the o was not only a major influence and resource on Polish migrant parents' school choice. It was also important um, as, it was also an important way of reconstructing their own identity and establishing that of their children's identity in England. In the context of geographical relocation, religion offers a means of preserving an ethnic tradition. This research found that after migrating to the UK, Polish migrants in the sample often increased their church attendance, particularly when they also needed to find a Catholic school, secondary school. But it's also, in, in terms of other research has also supported this, um, that Polish migrants will increase their church attendance once they arrive. The majority of the participants spoke about their astonishment of the diversity of school choice that existed in Britain in comparison to Poland. The respondents were, uh, were pleasantly surprised at the existence of Catholic schools, both at a primary and secondary school level in the UK. During communism rule in Poland, religious education had been forbidden um, in schools, despite the fact that Poland was a deeply Catholic society in which approximately 95% of its population are Catholic. The majority of interviews had had their formative years of education during the communist period. Their later years of education had been done during the transition period of the 1990s. Although the decentralisation of the Polish education system occurred in the late 1990s and the Catholic Church was once again allowed to be involved in the provision of education in Poland, none of the respondents had experienced this. Furthermore, the majority of respondents had either brought their children to Britain when they just started school Oh, sorry. When they, when they had ju just started school or had not started school and or given birth to them in the UK and as such they had not engaged with the Polish education system. Many stated that there is no such thing as a Catholic school in Poland. However, when they discovered the provision of Catholic schools in Britain, this was ultimately the first and only school choice in the UK for the majority of the respondents. The Polish migrant parents engaged with Catholic schools and practices they pursued in order to secure their child a place at these schools. And this illustrates how strategies and motivations adapt to the available commodity, as well as the necessity to cope in a new environment. Interestingly, despite the majority of participants' lack of awareness of Catholic schools in Britain prior to migration, once this option was available to them and they, beca they became very defensive about their right as a Catholic to receive a place at one of these schools. Many of the, am I, am I right for time? Many of the participants were very defensive of the Catholic schools admission policies and regulations. So I'm going to go on to my empirical findings now. So Gracia from London had talked about the importance of abiding by the Catholic schools admission policies. This was part of a wider discussion on how she believed some English parents lied about their religion to get their children into a Catholic school. Gracia's sense of entitlement to a Catholic school place may have resulted from the frustration she'd first experienced when she arrived in the UK and she tried to enrol her daughter into a Catholic primary school. She had repeatedly attempted this over several years, but was never successful and was continually um, told that there was a long waiting list. She'd enrolled her daughter into a Church of England primary school, 
because she'd wanted her child to have a Christian religious education, whether Catholic or otherwise. Interestingly, when we go to see her secondary school choices, she lists two of her secondary school choices as non-Catholic selective schools. So that's, that's one thing. Eventually, she, caught, she secured her daughter a place at a Catholic selective um, secondary school. Um, however, she still feels that her daughter had missed out during her primary school years due to school places being given to non-Catholics. Stefa from London, like many other participants, spoke about the perceived cultural differences between Polish and English people. One of the main themes that kept arising was dishonesty on part of English people. This ranged from lying on your CV to getting a better job to lying on applications to get a place at a better school. Many of the participants raised concerns that other parents, in particular English middle class parents, might pretend to be Catholic in order to secure their children a place at a Catholic secondary school. For example, Alicia had spoke about how she and her family attended their local Catholic Sunday service one day, as they did every single week, only to walk in and spot the mother of her daughter's friend sitting in the front row. In her recollection to me, she said she felt surprised and curious that this person who she spoke to regularly in the school playground had not mentioned her Catholicism before. Going to sit by her in church, she said, it's lovely to see you, I didn't know you were Catholic, at which point the mother turned to her and whispered, I'm not, but I need to attend this church for two years. It is surprising that a parent would be so open about their deceit. However, incidences like this seemed a common occurrence in several interviews, both in London and Nottingham. I feel by telling me this, the Polish parents were try trying to make a distinction between themselves as moral, honest Catholics, as opposed to someone who would use religious capital um, for their own gain. Gracia from London, for example, worried that when she was applying to her first choice school, a Catholic selective secondary school, her daughter's place may be at risk from deceitful English middle class parents. Henrietta from Nottingham had thoroughly researched the top ranking um, secondary schools, attended all the open evenings and spoke to both teachers and friends about schools. Her son had wanted to attend an academy school that was marked as outstanding by Ofsted. It's, it was one of the nearest secondary schools to, to them and all his friends from primary school were going there. However, Henrietta had felt that the two top schools in Nottingham were the Catholic ones. Therefore, without telling her son, she put the two, the two Catholic schools as first and second choice. In the end, she managed to secure a place for her son at the top Catholic secondary school. During the interview with me, she asserted that the two Catholic secondary schools were placed on the application because of her commitment to Catholicism and the desire to provide a religious education for her child, although she acknowledged that the Catholic schools were the best, referring to their high-ranked positions in Nottinghamshire league tables. Henrietta's decision to reject a top school in her catchment area and to choose to send her son to a high status Catholic school outside her catchment area had caused friction with her manager at work. According to Henrietta, the Catholic school at which she'd managed to secure a place was one that was in the catchment area of his residence. His daughter was the same age as her son and they had been applying for secondary schools at the same time. However, he'd never informed her that he was applying to this particular Catholic secondary school. It was only revealed after she'd mentioned that her son was going there in September that year and he had failed to get his daughter a, a place at that school. She told me this news had produced resentment towards her from her boss and this confused her because he was not Catholic. However, his reasoning was he deserved a place more because he lived near the school. It, it oh, oh, I'm so sorry. It was, was it on the... It, yeah, no. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, Margie from Nottingham also believes that there was some type of resentment from English middle class parents due to the ability of Polish migrants to send their children to the top <laughs> schools in Nottingham. Interestingly, Margie admitted that she didn't attend Sunday service and that her English husband was in fact atheist. Yet she still decided to send her daughter to the Catholic school oh, sorry. Um, because it was the best. 
not only due to its league table position, but also because of its policy on student discipline, a theme that continually arise. Um, I think now at this point, it's important con to contextualize the friction um, that existed, the apparent friction that existed between white middle class uh, parents and the Polish migrants seen in this research. Research by YouGov, which surveyed 4,000 people for an annual Westminster debate in 2013, found that faith schools were often chosen for quality, not religion. A similar survey was commissioned by the West, Westminster Hall debate on Catholic schools in 2014. The domineering debate centred around the social economic intake of Catholic schools admissions. Labour MP Barry Sherman argued that both Catholic schools and Anglian schools admitted fewer people from lower social economic background than would be expected based on the social demographic characteristics of the, of the Catholic population, for example, in England. Similar figures released by the Fair Admission Campaigns showed that Church of England schools admitted 31% fewer children on free school meals, while Roman Catholic churches, uh, sorry, Roman Catholic secondaries admitted 24% fewer free school meal pupils than would be expected given their area. A report by the Sutton Trust also indicated that higher socioeconomic um, economic status parents were twice as likely in comparison to poorer parents to use tactics such as faking religious beliefs in order to secure a place at a high ranking faith school. It was clear in my research that Catholic schools were seen to possess certain values and principles such as being more disciplined, promoting promoting Catholicism and providing a student community united by faith, which meant that their children would be around others with similar religious beliefs, a factor influencing their choice of school. Yet, in the case of Nottingham, I wondered what would have happened if the two top schools in Nottingham had not been Catholic. In London, for example, some parents appeared to possess more knowledge of the education market, partly due to the option of selective schools. Am I for time? Am I right? Okay. So going, going to the London example, it provides a clearer distinction between those parents who chose a Catholic secondary school because of, because of its religious ethos, um, no, sorry, sorry, yeah, and those who, despite asserting their religion to Catholicism, chose a selective school. Um, Polish participants in London had often claimed that their commitment to Catholicism guided their choice of Catholic school. Yet even those with low knowledge of the education market were still aware of the good reputation that Catholic schools held through their network within the Polish Catholic Saturday School and the church. Those Polish participants who had been living in the UK for a longer time also also possessed higher volumes and compositions of cultural capital and education capital demonstrated a deeper understanding of the working of the market. In particular, ways of gathering information, information and practices of comparing competitors with each other. Thus researching league tables and seeing that selective schools maintained a 100% pass rate of students achieving A star to C grades at GCSE strongly dictated their positioning of selective schools as first choice and actually sometimes the only choice over higher performing but not quite equally high performing non-selective Catholic schools. Contrast this to the case of Nottingham, in which two of the highest performing secondary schools were both Catholic. Unlike North London, Nottingham only had one selective school, and this was partially selective at best. Here we saw that the majority of the parents interviewed listed the Catholic schools as first and second choice, and the partially selective school as third choice and in many cases they didn't even put a third choice they only put the two Catholic schools as first and second choice. Again their rationale and insistence was that their dedication to Catholicism had determined their choice. In this example we see how the comparison between two different local education markets illustrates how the available commodity impacts upon the educational choice strategies that parents use. I'm going to go back to Gracia again. 
So Gracia from London insisted that Catholicism played a significant role in her choice of school. No, right, no. My, my slides are, sorry, my slides are really out of, not out of, they're out of sync from, because I, I changed it last minute, sorry. Right, so Gracia from London insisted that Catholicism had played a, a significant role in her choice of school, yet her choice of selective girls' Catholic school happened to be the highest ranked secondary school in her area. Her narrative centred around its performance, its league table positions and its variety of extracurricular activities. Gracia was highly educated with a master's in science. She had previously worked as a mechanical designer in Poland but was now a housewife. Both her parents had gone to university and her mother was an accountant while her father was an economist for the agricultural sector during communism. Gracia's husband was a qualified technician who worked in construction and she had a good income and hence she should not, did not face the same economic difficulties as lower skilled Polish migrants in this study. She actually chose three selective schools on the application form. Her first, first choice was the Selective Catholic Girls School. Her second and third choice were non-Catholic selective schools. This is, this is despite the fact that there were very high ranking Catholic secondary schools, non-selective non Catholic schools that she could have chose from in her area. Um, yeah, oh sorry, yeah. For this participant, other parents suggestion that she should put a non-selective Catholic school down on her application was seen as an insult. Gracia would eventually secure her daughter a place at her first choice school, the Selective Catholic Girls School. Stefia from London also offered an example of a person who only chose three selective schools. For her, for her choices. Stephia expressed with certainty that her daughter would appear, uh, would be able to pass the exams and she believed that as a mother she would give her daughter the best opportunity to attend the top schools in her area. Interestingly, again, um, the local Catholic school next to her that was recommended as an option um, by the teachers to put down in the application form was one of the highest performing schools in her area but yet not equally high performing as the selective schools but she still felt this was not good enough choice so do I have the quote there oh yeah we do yeah yeah, yeah. and um, so these examples illustrate Polish migrant parents who had chosen selective schools for these parents the private sector was out of their reach. They deployed their economic, social and cultural capital by pursuing whatever educational advantages they could. These came in the forms of private tuition, cultural activities and engagement. So not forgetting that if they wanted to get their children into these selective schools, they would have to undergo a two year Cumin process for them to be able to pass the entrance exam or give them a chance to pass the entrance exam. The additional expense of tutoring, expensive hobbies, hobbies cultural activities um, were invested in to, in to secure an aspired trajectory for their children's progression onto a good university. They were already thinking about this. For those Polish parents who purchased private cumin lessons, as well as sent their children to private music lessons, their consumption was always justified in a narrative of an aspired future trajectory for their children. The common trajectory discussed followed a particular pattern. The cumin lessons would, would assist in the selective school entrance exam. The music lessons would benefit them in the music aptitude test, which may secure them a musical scholarship at a selective school. This in turn would be used on their UCAS form, where their attendance at a selective school is perceived to almost guarantee good exam results. The consequence of this is admission into a good university and subsequently a well-paying well job and a good career. Unlike native-born middle-class parents who may be desperately trying to maintain their advantage at the perceived fear of possible downward social mobility for their children, the majority of the Polish parents were following this trajectory 
um, full initiative, we're, tr we're trying to increase the social mobility of their children. This is what Ball refers to as a, as a strategic sense that is related to class processes. Here, the parents are rejecting their past in some form in pursuit of an aspired present and a future through upward social reproduction of their children. Strategic decisions become paramount at points of transitions and where class resources come into play in order to make their aspirations a reality. The Polish Polish parents' children's social mobility did not simply circulate around educational performance and the schools attended, but was entwined with a narrative of acquiring a particular form of English middle class cultural capital, in which they perceived it to be a determining factor in increasing social mobility. There was a real awareness that education on its own was not enough. This may partially be explained um, for some by the participants' own educational capital from Poland, which was unrecognised and unacknowledged by white middle classes in the UK and in the job market. However, it must not be forgotten that some of the most ambitious and aspirational parents were those who'd left school and had never gone to university, but nonetheless possessed what Bourget had termed technical capital which in some case resulted in less, equid, less economic downward mobility upon arrival to the UK. So what we saw is that parents that had perhaps worked as teachers in Poland could not automatically work as a teacher when they migrated to London, uh, to England, whereas if you've had someone who was technically skilled in a, a, a trade such as plumbing, they could go on, do that job, and they may have more economic capital than a highly, a more high, higher educated person. The data presented so far, are we all right for time? Okay, yeah. The data presented so far has shown how the capacity to engage with choice can be class specific, as well as geographically influenced according to the local education market. As the majority of the participants in this research were highly educated and highly skilled, they brought with them a class habitus that determined to some extent their choice practices in pursuit of incre increased social mobility for their children. This means in many cases, the parents chose to send their children to the highest state of school, be that Catholic or selective. It is shown in the case of Marja um, that she chose to send her daughter to Catholic secondary school, even though she was no longer a practicing Catholic and her husband was an atheist. The majority of Polish migrant parents demonstrated a, submission, a, a sufficient amount of capacity and skill in choosing schools with the perceived future goal orientation for their children in mind, justified their decisions as being in the best interest for their children. In a very limited number of cases, this also meant putting the interests of their children first in terms of school choice and compromising their own political beliefs on equality. So let's contextualize this. Let's consider the Polish migrant parents' historical class location. Apart from a very limited number of participants whose grandparents were Polish aristocracy, Tracing back the social economic positions of my participants three generations showed that the majority of my participants, grandparents, had actually been peasant farmers and in most cases illiterate. Their own parents may have been the first in their family to go to university as a result of positive discrimination policies that had, to, that had existed during the communist regime, particularly during the 1950s and 60s. Secondly, the Polish participants experienced downward mobility and, and deskilling upon migrating to the UK. Thirdly, when looking at their, their current social economic positions, it can be seen that the majority of Polish parents in this research could not afford to send their children to private schools if they'd wanted to. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Third, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, paying for cooing lessons um, often resulted in taking additional work 
including in the informal, the informal economy. So what I saw is that many parents would do cash in hand work to pay for cumin lessons to give their children a chance at the selective entrance exam. Many of the participants in this study spoke about the discrimination they faced in the UK. Some of the Polish parents in the interview spoke about placing their own preference of school on the application form whilst not informing their children that they had done so, leaving their children to believe that their own desired school had been listed. They spoke about wanting to give their children the best possible opportunity, particularly when there was a sense of guilt surrounding moving their children from one country to another. Getting their children into a good school was seen by the respondents as a responsibility of being a good parent. Good parenting is not class neutral concept. Wall argues that the middle class parents consider happiness of their children to refer to not just the present situation, but also his and hers social economic position in future life. As such, the child's own wishes and preferences um, come second to that of the parents when choosing schools. What the Polish parents in this research who engaged in this type of behaviour demonstrated adheres to the concept of what is seen to be a good parent. Their children's future educational success and economic security was seen as more important than the child's wishes at age 10 or 11 years of age. These respondents did not have the security of economic capital that would allow, their, would allow them to remove their children at any given moment and send them to a private school. Parenting practices involving authoritarian control and strictness supervision have been linked to educational success. It is important that these respondents are not stereotyped as over-possessive, over-protective, too controlling, but rather that their practices are located within the research on school choice and social class. They should not be seen as problematic, as in the case of the British Chinese parents who were stereotyped in this way um, by teachers in Archer and Francis's research in 2005. Their behaviour exemplifies typical middle class school choice practices. However, they do not have the security to take risk with their children's futures. So lastly, do I have time for this? Yeah. So, well, it's a, it's a laughing the opting out for market. So, yeah. so lastly, I'm just going to touch on two participants. If I don't have time, I'll touch on one. So we've got, well, we'd like to have some time. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to touch on participants who actually opted out of the market. So I didn't go on to, yeah. So, um, the risk of choice is associated with assertion that is open to all. Hence, although parents employ specific strategies to advance their children in the education system, the child's social reproduction is never guaranteed. There is always a risk that the parents may make the wrong choice resulting in downward mobility for their children, who are then overtaken by children whose parents have made the right choice, which maintains or increases their, social, their children's social position. As Walger and Batansky acknowledged, economic capital can be used to accumulate cultural capital, particularly in the form of institutional capital as seen in educational qualifications. I'm going to just completely skip that right now, and I'm going to talk about Stefana, uh, uh, not Stefana, um, Solomia. Solomia was the only participant from London who chose a private secondary school for her child. Not only was it a private school, but it was one of the top elite schools in the country. Her son had spent his first two years in education in a high-ranking Catholic secondary school in a wealthy area of London. However, this was only because she was on a waiting list for a private primary school place. Once it was available, he was sent there immediately and then progressed on to a private junior school. At the time of the interview, he was, on, he, he was waiting to start the elite secondary school. Solomia's main rationale for private education was that she felt her son was talented and could not receive the attention he deserved from the state sector. She had wanted her son to be in a smaller class. The available facilities at the private school, such as the large, the large sports hall, um, as well as the option of boarding in what she described as a beautiful and gorgeous campus, 
were also justified um, in her choice of school. But what stood out most from Solomia's narrative was her discussion of surrounding her son in an environment that felt right and that he would be with people like himself. Solomia and her husband had aristocratic heritage, were both highly educated and were in the top social economic position in the UK as categorized by stock. When I asked her why she chose to pay for his education, she justified it in terms of the devaluation of qualifications and providing a future opportunity for her son, whether he takes it or not. Um, and so, as she says here, um, he will receive a good education and that is my investment in him. In the case of Solomia, we see how her former family heritage generates social reproduction in her life trajectory, despite both sides of the family having their wealth and assets seized under communism. Their cultural capital continued to be reproduced. During the communist period, while Salomia was growing up, she undertook pseudonyms, by the way, she undertook private Spanish and French lessons outside compulsory state educated schooling. Solomia was able to reflect upon her own social reproduction through her family's wealth and title um, that were taken away by the Communist Party. She understood how her family, her former family's social position advantaged was transmitted through education and to what extent that education during that period was coach, coachly distinguished her. And so she said here, where I was raised and brought up, you know, my parents, for example, were of higher education. They were intellectuals. They would have friends from similar intellectual circles. Next door, you could, be, you could have the richest guy in the world. But if he was not educated, if he had made his fortune in, I don't know, plumbing gadget, he would not be accepted into our circle because the con conversation with him, apart from the old job, would not be at a certain level. I guess when you ask me what the noble family history gave me, it probably gave me an elitist attitude, but it's less to do with birthright nowadays and more to do with education. I'm going to completely miss one, the other participant who chose a, a chose private school in Nottingham because I think it illustrates similar things. Um, so in strategies of reproduction, those from higher social economic backgrounds safeguard, maintain and improve their economic, social and cultural capital. Hence, those with the most economic capital can transform the means of reproduction, moving the goalposts in order to secure, an edu secure the education system as a means of privileged social reproduction. So, in conclusion, I have argued, um, okay. in conclusion, I have argued that upon migration, Polish migrant parents are confronted with a marketized education system that they have never seen on such a scale before. This marketized education system also gives them the power to engage with school choice practices. The education of their children now demands negotiation with a system that increasingly entrenches them within a neoliberal doctrine of consumer choice. These theoretical and ideological issues influence the choice of school for their children are also interconnected and interdependent with wider structural inequalities, social class, race and ethnic division. The, the parents become increasingly aware of these divisions as they start to apply market indicators to the assessments of potential schools for their children. Moreover, so embedded were some of the participants within this market choice based system that they started to use Catholicism as a pawn to enhance their children's opportunity of securing a place at a high performing Catholic secondary school. This is not to deny that Catholicism plays an important role in other aspects of the participants' life, but rather to acknowledge the observation that was made during the field work. When participants' school choices were limited, the more entitled they believed they were to a place at the local high-performing Catholic secondary school. Careful examination of the parents' background, including their life in Poland before they migrated, their education, their work in history, their own parents' occupation position under communism, as well as that of their grandparents before communism, illustrated the generational social reproduction. These strategies of social reproduction were also observable in their new settlement in Britain and were being transmitted generationally to that of their children. However, having experienced downward 
mobility themselves in terms of their lower social economic position in Britain as opposed to Polish society, it remains to be seen whether their children will manage to take advantage of the educational capital acquired under the British setting, or whether they themselves will face the same ethnic discrimination in the British labour market that their parents have had to endure. Part of the Polish parents' social reproduction was known exactly how to use their cultural and economic capital in their quest for the accumulation of educational capital for their children. Furthermore, in order to facilitate the intergenerational transmission of cultural capital, parents needed a sufficient level of economic capital to engage in the extracurricular activities of their children. Families would particularly need sufficient income to pay for private tuition in order to assist their children's educational career, as their own lack of knowledge of the British education system, in addition to the cultural and language barriers, would place their children at disadvantage in comparison to native-born parents who had been educated to the same level as the majority of the Polish participants. To sum up, the findings that Catholic schools were often the main and in some cases the only choice is not surprising. However, what was interesting was how the different schools available in different local education markets impacted upon Catholic school choice. Nottingham, in Nottingham, the Catholic schools that were chosen by the majority of participants, these were ranked higher in the league tables than that of the partially selective school with a good reputation. Here we saw narratives on the insistence that the Catholic school was the only choice, even to the extent that some Polish parents refused to put free choices on their secondary school application and instead placed only the two performing Catholic schools. In London, the highly aspirational parents were faced with a dilemma whether to pick a non-Catholic -sele non selective school over a non-selective Catholic school. These selective schools came with a status, particularly as the children were selected on ability. Securing a place at one of these schools would illustrate to the Polish community how good a parent you were. Thus, the most educationally aspirational parents chose to select, uh, chose the selective school over the non-selective Catholic school. It could be argued that this very specific and small case study shows that the Polish parents had been absorbed into the individualistic market education system. Indeed, the longer the migrant had been living in the UK, the more knowledge they possessed on school choice strategies. Thank you, Victoria. Um, thanks very much. That was a really rich and engaging presentation. There's a lot. Sorry. No, it was really good. Can, should, shall we take a little break and have help ourselves to refreshments and then we can address some questions and comments um, for discussion. We've got... Yeah, if they wanted to get their children into the Catholic secondary school, they realised they had to start attending the church. But also I think there was, a, there was enough dimension, I said the religious, um, ethnic di dimension that when I think when you're migrating and you're moving away from home, you want to kind of build those communities and those networks and I think it's a way of establishing your own ethnic identity in, in the new settlement country but also that of your children as well so that is po possibly why because if you go to a, a church where there's predominantly a, lo a lot of Polish other, other Polish mig migrants it's linked to the Saturday school it's yeah It, well, yeah. And uh, your own research is London based, Nottingham. Nottingham, yeah. And are there other people who are doing similar sorts of research in some different parts of the country? For instance, if you took um, uh, uh, another region of the United Kingdom, mm. like Northern Ireland, for instance, where there are more. I could imagine, where, yeah. Where more, um, sort of schools, yeah. which are sort of like yeah. um, Catholic, yeah. whereas a lot of the other schools are actually mimics. How does your research compare to you know, that other school? Are you the only groundbreaking yeah. person in this field? That, that's actually incredibly interesting because I haven't actually seen any research. And now that you've mentioned that, I just think there is actually quite a large 
Polish migration to actually Ireland. Yeah. So I'm ju I'm just thinking like I haven't seen I haven't actually seen any any stuff and there there should be some stuff so but I'm going to go in now research and see who has, has someone looked at Polish migration to Ireland. It would also be interesting if you said that the the immigration from Poland has been the largest in the region. Yeah. You look at, yeah. I think in Northern Ireland it's only seventy. It's the largest throughout the UK because. Because the EU accession was was a large, so the A8 migrants when we joined in 2000, the, the EU accession happened in 2004. Was we did have have like an unprecedented flow of migrants that they hadn't been expecting because they based these figures on Spain and and the other e, the EU countries before, and they hadn't expect they hadn't expected this. But what had happened that Polish for some reason Polish migration was the largest overall. So I think wherever you went, I could have picked any because this this came up in my file. I could have picked any city, really, and looked because you go anywhere and it, it, Polish migration is is very prominent. And I think what's really interesting though is the the fact that it's long term, and that the migrants probably hadn't migrated with that in mind. And I think that's what makes it the most interesting. Can I just add yeah. it to this before we move to another? question. In terms of Northern Ireland, though, you don't have the school choice playing out in the same way because, yes. because you don't have the, market. You don't, the Catholic schools are not the good schools. There's a, there are a range uh, of Catholic yeah. schools. Um, so you would have different, it would be a really interesting it comparison. Does, that would be I don't really know if anyone's done it as far as I know. I don't know. I, I really, yeah, I won't. But anyway. <laughs> post -doc kind of yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> post -doc. Um, just, I was, I was, I was, you touched a little bit then about, about the, um, one of the things that you were talking struck me was this, sort of but one is about familiarity and one is about kind of fear and vulnerability and both of being strong reasons why you might want to engage in a, in a community that you remember and were part of from the, when you came into the country. And I was wondering whether you noticed, I think you might have touched slightly with the notice the impact of, of um, time since people arrived in the country as to how important was yeah, I mean, what I did try to do was it was very difficult because my main research sites were Polish Catholic, uh, uh, were Saturday schools, and that's where I'd recruited most of my um, participants. But I had tried to recruit people that weren't engaging in Polish Saturday schools and what this had meant is that in some way they had rejected Catholicism and, and they had tend to associate it with everything that they perceived as being bad right. with Poland and, and particularly women's repression and stuff like that. And, and sorry, I forgot the question. So the second part was with the degree, I guess, to which people felt um, safe and accepted within the country perhaps over time, whether, that, whether then Catholicism became less of a... Uh, of, a, of a way of sort of writing yourself. It could, yeah. I mean, it could. I, I don't know because that wasn't part of my research. But it would, it would be interesting to go back and 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 interview Polish migrants that perhaps had been living here for 20 years and seeing how they were. Perhaps what was their church engagement and stuff like that. But at the time, these were newly arrived migrants. Yeah, right. They were. This was a way of establishing now that they had children. And as I said, I did. I did have a. a quite a number of participants who weren't engaging with the Catholic Catholicism but but this is because they were very political and they were very they they saw they saw that as this is what they wanted to escape when they came to yeah particularly and they would they wouldn't send their children to the Polish Saturday school for a particular reason they weren't going to send them to the Catholic secondary school so yeah but no that's that's a very interesting point and Potentially a postdoc. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. That was really interesting. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, quite a few years ago, I did some work about parents choosing single-sex or co-ed schools in the private, so there were private food paying schools. Yeah. And a lot of what you were talking about resonated with that because, yeah. so principally, it was less about whether there was single-sex or co-ed, and more about status and, and discipline as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite strongly. although it was a bit different because it was that old thing about single-sex schools being seen to be better for gold and not for mm, gold. Mm, so mm. like, but I noticed you mentioned about there were single-sex 
holding your sample, so I wondered how that had... Yeah, so, so this, uh, this is really interesting. So in Nottingham, for example, the two top schools were Catholic schools and they were mixed. But in North London, for the, for the area I was doing, they had a high percentage of selective schools still remaining, the old grammar schools. And actually quite a few of those were single sex schools. So they were the Catholic boys school or the Catholic girls school. And actually in the narratives of the parents, when they did say they justified the choice of their school, they did actually justify it in terms of, I want my daughter to go to a single sex girl school but then you looked at the other two choices and they were still selective schools that were mixed and you're like okay but um yeah yeah that that is interesting but they did in the that particularly for for girls i think that was more of a, a particularly for polish polish girls and and it, this was actually a, a theme that did come out in my my research as well that the polish mothers had felt that there was too much of a kind of sexualization at a young age of girls in Britain and they were very worried and there was a, there was a, quite a bit of friction between the mother daughter relationship um, yeah so so they felt like the girls should be involved in the domestic labor and helping around the house like they had done with their mother and they felt that their daughters weren't doing that because they were being influenced by English peer groups um, so it's really, but yeah, I know that, yeah, particularly for girls, so they did want their girls to get, so as I said, so when they did have the choice, they did put, so, so with, for example, Gracia, she did put the Catholic selective girls school as the first choice, so for girls more, yeah, that was more important. in terms of admissions you mentioned that, you said some, some of the parents refused to put a third choice yeah. and in Nottingham only in Nottingham even more interesting. Mm. Um, so in terms of not putting a third choice with uh, the admissions code yeah. um, in education a third choice yeah. will be given by the local authority still although there are different sectors did you come across that at all? Did you come across any parent or family that ended up with a third choice? No, okay. I didn't. It's very interesting. The, the one example I didn't get time to go into was the other person who looked into the private. So it was um, that Susanna who'd looked into the private sector in Nottingham and she put her child through, a, a, she, she enrolled her child into a private school, but she did actually get her first choice, which was the Catholic school. But it's because she was told she might not get her first choice that freaked her out. And then she was like, I'm going to investigate the private sector. And once she'd done that, she was like, okay, like this is the only acceptable choice for my daughter. Again, she was from the intelligentsia. Um, and she had an English husband, so she had a bit more of economic capital. But no, I, I did wonder, and I did say to them many times, like, why did you only put two choices? Like, what had they haven't given you the two choices? But they were so obstinate. They were like, I didn't care. That was my two choices. But they didn't give me that. They, they, so this is what I mean about the like the kind of the local Pacific market. So the, the, the more limited the market. So when they they had less options, and that the first two the best schools were the two Catholic schools. They not only were they the best Catholic schools, they were the best schools in Nottingham in the league. They would only put those two choices. It's just interesting, isn't it? Because the appeals process. That goes after yeah, I never, I, but I, I hadn't, I hadn't encountered one person who'd actually know my thinking. No, I had, yeah. But then she, there was, there was actually, I, I like, there was one person who hadn't got the Catholic schools, but she'd got her, she'd got her two daughters into the selective school. But she had put a third choice. But of all the participants, she was the only one that had put a third choice. The other ones had hadn't put a third choice. And then you're wondering then um, what's going on there. Just got one more question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, about destinations. So during 
your research, did you ever have an opportunity to see where the destinations were with these children when they went on after No, the I'd love that. Okay. I would, I would, I would, with boys and girls. I know. I would, that, was, that would be, I don't know, yeah, it was a job once, and I, I, I tried to it because it was about um, teenage Polish children. And, um, and and what had happened to them since they'd come since. But no, I, I, I would absolutely love to see, and I, and I actually put in my PhD thesis, that I would love to revisit this research in 20 years' time yeah. and see the trajectory of these children. As I said, like, are they going to face the same ethnic discrimination that their parents had? Because their parents had a lot of cultural capital, they were very highly educated, but they did face the language barriers. They didn't have the same cultural capital, but they were. But this actually made them want their children to have a specific type of English middle class cultural capital, and they endowed that into their children. And it'd be very interesting to go back and see in 20 years' time what has happened. I know when, when I did my thesis, I looked, I looked at America, for example, which had a long history of Polish migration. And um, for three generations, they had been socially upward, mo upward mobile. By the fourth generation, they were American, and it, it, the ethnic dimension had, had gone. But I'd be very interested in 20 years' time to kind of go back and see what's happened. Thank you, and your seminar was quite interesting. I, I don't have your full, um, I don't know what of seminar would you have for now. I thought that the seminar, we could have um, a seminar paper available so maybe we could just read while the seminar is going on. I don't know. So I don't have a full knowledge of all that you have just said. But yeah, yeah. you said something about um, the Catholic uh, school, the quality. Of the, the, the academic status of the uh, Catholic yeah, yeah. So I just want to find out if your research was able to find out um, um, the um, uh, the academic um, quality of um, Catholic schools in Poland. No. No. So as as I mentioned during communist rule, okay. Catholic schools you weren't allowed to cut. The church wasn't allowed, I mean, you weren't even allowed to be a Catholic during communism. It, it was very, very, you know, v Poland was the only country, one of the only European, Eastern Euro European country where they kind of accepted it. But the church wasn't allowed to be in the, involved in the provision of education. This had only happened after they'd broken up, after the, the kind of, you know, the, the downfall of the... Um, Eastern European blog, um, but no, as I as I said, there were because when I did go and, and research what was going on in current um, system education system in Poland, there are Catholic schools there, but my participants weren't aware of that because they just missed that. So I don't know the status of that. And what my participants my participants have said is that. They found one of the things they found was so confusing because you live in an area, you send your child to the local school. That was it. There was no choice. So this was for them. This is like it was a minefield. Like they came here and they're like, what? <laughs> there's all this choice. And then this is my catchment area, and then there's Catholic school, so I can send my child outside this catchment area. And they were so. And then I've got to spend two years and all this money to get them to an edge. They, yeah, it, it was, yeah. So in, in Poland, I'd have to go back and look more what's going on in Poland. But I think the Catholic Church has become a little bit more involved in Poland over the lot since the fall of communism and since the late 1990s. But my participants hadn't experienced that, and it's not to the same extent as here, whereas the Catholic Church has been involved since you know the 19th century because of Irish migration to the UK. Yeah. How did that reflect the kind of 
well, it reflected they were going to pick Catholic schools. Okay. So, yeah, that was a reflection of my point. So, yeah, no, so what had happened, so originally I'd started off with, I was just thinking at London, and I'd done my MA, and I'd, my MA had been on um, um, A8 migrants, actually, and I was just looking at A8 migrants, and um, I, I can't remember. But it was it was just a migrants and social class and and transformation habitus and stuff like that, and so it had a couple of participants through that who'd had children. So I firstly sort started to go to interview them, and I thought I could do like a snow snowballing sample, and I was I wasn't having much luck with that. So I knew the local um at the the local Saturday school in my area so I'd gone to them and they and I, I do have to thank them they were so willing and so helpful and they just said yep and they sent out emails to everyone and they said if you and I actually had people coming up to me whose children weren't age appropriate and they were like oh can we do an interview with they they really want to be involved I was like, I'm sorry your children aren't your children a bit young you know can't do it but um yeah no so but the cast the, the Saturday school was linked to the Catholic Church. So that is why. But then again, I say 95% of the Polish population is Catholic. So I don't think it's too much of a, 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 a drive away from what might be happening with other... And I did, as I said, I did, I did interview other people who weren't engaging with with Saturday schools and, and, and weren't, were atheists and were very political, but they were very, very negative about Catholicism for many other reasons. Um, yeah, and again, when I went to Nottingham, I just decided my, the Polish Saturday school would be the obvious recruit. So it was, it, it was basically kind of convenient sampling. Well, let's just say some ways you use at a young, quite a younger age group, say, I don't know, uh, about the age eight or nine, that's quite an interesting area as well, because when, when it, parents are beginning to think about, seriously about that's it, yeah. secondary school choice, and yeah. when they might think about starting coaching, yeah. and, it, and also I think it's an area of about hearsay, rumour, mm. and all that goes on, and it's just yeah. unbelievable, and, and also what they say publicly. Yeah. yeah so so literally like so I, w I was looking for children so I was looking for parents with children in um, their children would be in I, I forget the year now but they were aged kind of 10 to 9 um, between that age group um, and I found that actually the more the, the parents that hold held like higher volumes of economic a social uh, capital would, had already been in, involved. They were thinking about this at year eight, uh, not year eight, age eight. Yeah, yeah. They, they'd already had them in coming lessons. So. That's, that's, that's the private coaching. Yeah, the private, the, the, the two year, yeah. the two year um, uh, tuition that they had to undergo to be able to do the entrance exam. And one of the things they said is that they were really surprised about the like kind of English people, like, like when they tried to speak to them, they wouldn't give them any information. There was so much secrecy, they, like, they just couldn't work this out. And they, they got their information from particularly Asian groups, Asian migrant groups. And this is where they, got, they shared that information. And they were very communal in terms of their sharing as well, of, of what they did. And, and again, what, what I said is like they were very, very um, kind of, objective about the education system in terms of like like these people wouldn't want to send their children to Catholic schools if they you know all schools were good but it's only and I thought, sorry I forgot the question your question no, I was just really I just was wondering how much you know if you've, if you've been against it if you've thought about going back with that you already had started quite an early age but I think it's Really well, but by the time I find, but by the time I'd found them, I was looking for people that had. But I was looking. My criteria was to look for people who were applying for schools then, so within those two years. Um, but then again, I found people that were applying for schools, but 
in terms of their compositions of economic and social and educational capital, um, the ones that the highest status ones had already been thinking about this by the time I'd already got there. So they knew so they were preparing their children already. So, and, and that is not even to do with actually, because I, I say there were, there were a couple of parents actually that weren't, that may not be classed as higher educated, but they'd got this information and they were very aspirational. And um, they'd worked cash in hand, so they, they'd gone and done cleaning works and stuff like that to pay, to pay for the Kumin lessons. And it was what they found out is that the migrant groups, particularly Asian migrant groups, were the ones that were sharing the information with them, were, were actually recommending the tutor, like you can come. And so what they were doing is they were forming their own little groups of like, we'll get all our five children together and we'll pay for a let, we'll pay for a, a common uh, person to, to get our children. And they were doing that with within Asian groups. But that but what they were very disturbed about was the English middle classes that was so secretive and then the resentment that that was produced when they got their children into these schools they were like you know yeah. thank you i think um we've, we've come to the end of the time here but we do um we jenny can stay behind for a little bit if anyone has any any further questions um but i know we did manage to have a couple of questions uh, but thanks so much for everyone for coming and for um, engaging um, in the discussion. Um, the co a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and the video will be available on the address website. <laughs> oh, I just say my PowerPoint. I don't, I don't agree with PowerPoint presentation. So it was basically, it, it was just done in terms of the charts that Which, needed to um, be done. And a rule for people who come to present, they don't get to apologise for their excellent presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much. And um, yeah, thanks again, Jen.